Hi again, and welcome back, uh, everybody. Day three of the Conference Board of Canada's Canadian Immigration Summit. Uh, once again, uh, I'm Ian Reeve, Associate Director for Immigration Research. Uh, kicking us off today uh, for some really exciting uh, day three panels and sessions, uh, which are going to start right away. Uh, just a couple of logistical things again off the start. Um, as you know, if you've been here for the past couple days, but just as a refresher for anyone who's joining us for the first time today, uh, there's lots of ways you'll be able to interact with our speakers uh, during the, the various webcasts through the day. Uh, the most important way is through the Q&A engagement tool, which you'll see in a box labeled Q&A um, in your ON24 platform window. Uh, type your questions there for our speakers and uh, the moderators will be able to see those and we'll draw them and integrate them into our discussions. There's also, of course, a live audience chat function that allows you to chat with your fellow audience members. Uh, just know that if you type any questions into the audience chat, uh, that the moderator won't necessarily see them for Q&A. So if it's a question for the panelists, use that Q&A tool. Um, we'll also remind you that if you've missed any exciting sessions over the last couple of days, any of the concurrent sessions or things where you had to be drawn away, everything will be made available to you for the next 30 days through the engagement hub, the same hub that you use to access this session. Uh, so be sure to go back and check out any of the great content that you may have missed so far. Uh, while you're there, you can also take a look at the pages of our sponsors. Um, our sponsors are essential to bringing uh, the summit to you, uh, and uh, all of them provide services either directly to immigrants or for organizations that support immigrants. So please do take time to check out uh, what they have on offer as well. Lastly, if you have any questions or any technical issues, uh, there's an FAQ guide uh, in the resources um, and also contains contact information for our staff uh, who can provide you with support. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to pass us off for a, uh, a short but really, really, really interesting presentation um, from Bobby Sahini with Ethnicity Matters on behalf of Imagine Canada. So over to you, Bobby. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, Ian, and thanks to the uh, Conference Board of Canada for, for having me today. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are logging in from, uh, from across the country. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I, I have the pleasure of really being the, uh, the appetizer for you all uh, before we get into a fantastic panel on, on bold ideas for Canadian immigration. And I think when it comes to bold ideas, um, you know, it really starts with, with bold conversations and, and bold intentions. Uh, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey and an outcome, which was uh, a, the Imagine Canada study that, that started as a, a bold conversation about um, 10 years ago. Um, time is, is the enemy for me because there's a lot to cover, and I, I do want to get through it as quickly as possible. So I'm going to do a quick introduction, a little bit of a background uh, of, of what brings us to this point. Uh, then I'm going to give you some of the highlights of, of the Imagine Canada study uh, that we did, which I'll introduce to you, uh, to you in a moment. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to share with you five key takeaways or, or really bold ideas that, um, you know, irrespective of what industry you're in, um, you know, which organization you're in, I think these bold takeaways or, or these key takeaways are, are absolutely relevant uh, for anyone living and working in Canada today. So uh, again, my name is Bobby Sani. I am co-founder and partner of Ethnicity Matters. I really wish uh, Bruce McDonald uh, was here today. Uh, Bruce is the president and CEO of Imagine Canada. And the study that we did was actually 10 years in the making. I, I met Bruce uh, about 10 years ago while he was the president and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters Canada. Uh, I was the former head of multicultural marketing at Rogers, and I was speaking at a conference, and after that conference, Bruce came to me and said, you know, you just changed my entire outlook uh, on my business. You made me feel like as big brothers, big sisters, we may not be relevant um, to the communities and the children that we are servicing, if, if not today, at least in the future. Um, given the influx of immigrants and, and the changing face of this country, we may no longer be uh, relevant. And, and surely our, our donor pool is probably shrinking, uh, shrinking so we, we absolutely need to diversify that donor pool. So that, that bold conversation, you know, 10 years ago, uh, what that led to fast forward was, you know, initiative or a hypothesis that we had, which was others in the charitable sector and the nonprofit sector are probably also facing this uh, this dilemma 
are we relevant to the changing face of Canada? Uh, and really, what does that mean for the, the future of, of our, our sector? Uh, so with that, what we did was we formed uh, an industry coalition, uh, a number of partners that actually came to the table uh, to do what is arguably, uh, what, which is being dubbed uh, the largest um, study in Canadian history on multicultural and newcomer uh, charitable giving. And really the intention of this study was, was to act as a playbook uh, for the charitable sector, for the nonprofit sector, uh, to help give them some, um, some answers um, some guidelines as they uh, go down this journey of changing and evolving their businesses to be more relevant uh, to multicultural Canada. I absolutely uh, would recommend that everybody watching today download the report. You can uh, download it for free from the Imagine Canada website. And there's over 250 pages of data that again, would be applicable irrespective of which industry uh, you are in. In terms of the methodology of the study, you know, diversity is the key here. We, we surveyed a, a wide group of, of ethnic communities, uh, South Asian, Chinese, Filipino, um, Afro-Caribbean or Caribbean descent, as well as African de descent. So actually taking the uh, black Canadian segment and understanding that there is diversity within diversity within that community and being very intentional about wanting to speak to uh, as many audiences as possible. The Arab and the Iranian community, uh, as you can see, we surveyed over 3000 responders. So a pretty fair sample size to, to give us some, some real meaty data and right across the country. Uh, um, you know, we've got uh, voices from right across the country, uh, but also uh, surveying people across different tenures in, in Canada and also of, of different uh, economic um, background as well, uh, speaking to a large number of, of very affluent Canadians as well to see how some of the results uh, might differ across the uh, board. So I'm going to share with you some of the top highlights of the study. You know, the first thing that we found um, thankfully, was that newcomers and multicultural communities are very giving. Uh, you know, I've always believed that that newcomers coming to Canada are, are so giving in so many different ways. They are enriching our lives with culture. They are uh, connecting us to new markets and individuals back home. Uh, but what the study showed was that they are also very giving of money and time in terms of volunteerism. So that was something fantastic to see. Uh, also interesting to see that in terms of the uh, donating tendencies, that will vary across uh, different economic and personal characteristics. Those that are employed in this country um, you know, tend to give more. If you are employed full-time, you're giving even more. So there is, again, this diversity within diversity when it comes to uh, donor representation as well. We also found that donations rise um, as immigrants spend more time in Canada. We found that if you are born in Canada, your, your giving rates are, are actually um, higher. But the more time you are spending in Canada, um, the more you also tend to give, and you're giving larger amounts as well. So absolutely, uh, tenure in Canada affects the giving patterns of uh, new Canadians in this uh, country. Respondents, they give because of the right reasons. And, and that is something that is, is so important. Uh, important. They have a, a, a range of reasons for giving, but really um, intrinsically everybody is giving because they feel it's the right thing uh, to do. We also found that uh, individuals do tend, again, based on their tenor, do tend to give uh, to causes and charities, even families. Uh, back home or outside of Canada, but one thing that stays consistent irrespective of your tenure is this importance of giving to the local uh, community as well, which is something that we also thought was, um, w which was so important. Giving in general is rooted in family and religious values. Now, some of this we, going into the study, you know, I, our hypothesis was this. We know that many cultures, many religions, um, you know, as, as part of, of that religion, 
you know, it is it is so imperative uh, to give, whether it's a, a percentage of your annual income or your time. Um, but what was great was that we now have the data to back up that many of these communities are giving because it is rooted in their family or religious values. They generally have empathy for other people. And, you know, often I've, I've heard so many um, leaders in this country talking about how immigrant values are, are Canadian values. And I think that showed up in this study as well. Uh, they're absolutely giving for the right reasons. It is really part of, of what they believe and what they value. And also, we found that these values and these traditions are actually passed on to their children as well. So in, in my eyes, the future of Canada uh, is in a great place when we are teaching our children uh, that it is important to give. Some causes are supported uh, more than others. We see, saw a wide range of, of causes being supported, but we did see certain uh, patterns that would emerge. For many, the default choice, for many immigrant and multicultural communities, the default choice is to give to religious or cultural organizations. But again, with tenure, those patterns also tend to change, and you see a wider variety of causes that are being uh, contributed uh, to as well. So also something that was very important for us to see. Seasonal giving and motivations were also high. And I think the real important takeaway here is we, you know, around Christmas time, as an example, the holiday season, we'll see a lot of nonprofits out there with their campaigns uh, focused on seasonable, uh, seasonable giving. And what was interesting to see here was that many of the multicultural and new immigrant communities were absolutely giving at those more quote unquote mainstream uh, times of giving, whether it was Christmas or Thanksgiving or Easter. But you can also see that during um, more multicultural festivals and events, you know, whether it was a Diwali or a Chinese New Year or an Eid, uh, you also saw these individuals were giving at those times of year as well. And really the takeaway here, the, the indication here for us is that these communities Immigrants in Canada are absolutely uh, Canadian, but they're also multicultural as well. They're waving two flags and they actually have a foot in both worlds. So we can't try to pigeonhole these communities as one thing or another. We have to understand that they are living in two worlds and, and we have an opportunity to, to get the most, best of both worlds uh, from them as well. We know that during the, the, the pandemic, and, and obviously we're still in the pandemic, we know that many immigrant communities were disproportionately affected uh, by COVID-19. Uh, but we actually went out with a, a, a secondary survey um, right at the height of COVID to see, well, what was happening uh, for giving and volunteering during the pandemic? And, and very happy to see that, at least amongst Chinese and South Asian respondents, uh, which was the, the core group that we surveyed in the follow-up, we found that um, donations were up amongst these communities versus the general population. So even in a pandemic, even though these communities were disproportionately affected by COVID-19, they were still giving and they were actually giving more than the, than the general population. Further to that, their intention to volunteer was also up as well. So absolutely um, some great uh, findings here as well. And, and lastly, and the main takeaway, at least for the charitable sector, the nonprofit sector, is that it's critically important to engage these communities. And what we found that if we are very intentional about our efforts, if we are strategic and we have these bold conversations uh, with ethnic communities, new immigrant communities, we could unlock approximately $1.7 billion that could be made available to the charitable and non uh, profit sector. So a huge growth opportunity uh, for this sector and definitely a lot of learnings for everybody that is watching today. Um, very quick takeaways. Like I said, there's so much more information in the study, but I wanted to frame this uh, be before we get into the, the panel. Um, you know, for me, 
this study and, and this discussion, this should all be centered around growth. Uh, immigration, in my opinion, is a growth strategy for the country. It must be a growth strategy for each and every organization across this country as well. Whether you a, are a nonprofit, a for-profit, it doesn't matter. This is all about growth, and it's all about unlocking that growth potential here. The other thing that we found, a key takeaway, immigrants are absolutely givers. Um, I, I want that to be loud and clear. Immigrants are coming to this country. They are enriching our lives in so many ways, but they are also very giving of funds. They are also very giving of their time as well. Another important key takeaway for everybody watching. There is diversity within diversity, however. You know, I mentioned that we surveyed a number of different ethnic communities right across the country different tenures, different economic status as well. There are nuances across those communities. We can't necessarily paint everybody with the same brush. We've got to dig a little bit deeper and really understand that diversity within diversity. And again, the same applies to anyone um, watching or listening today uh, for your organization. Let's get a little bit more granular in the data that we're looking at and, and understand those subtle nuances as well. Immigrants wave two flags. Immigrants are, are proudly Canadian, but most of them are also very proud of where they have come from as well. And that's something that we need to recognize as well. They are absolutely, many of them, still giving uh, to causes, charities, family members back home, uh, you know, from a, from a funds perspective, but they are also giving very locally as well. They are giving during Christmas, but they are also giving during Diwali, Chinese New Year, um, Ramadan and Eid as well. So we absolutely have to understand that they do wave these two flags and we need to understand uh, that nuance as well. And, and finally, like I said, you know, this is a call to action for, for really all organizations, not just the, um, the, the charitable sector, uh, but really for all organizations. The time to take action is now. In the next three years, 1.2 million immigrants coming to this country. What is your growth strategy? How do you intend to tap into that immense growth that is coming to this country? All organizations need to be intentional. Um, they need to act with purpose, and it starts with having bold conversations and bold ideas. So on that, Ian and, uh, and the rest of the team, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, Bobby, thanks so much. Uh, just fascinating research and just one more way that we can understand the contribution that immigrants make to uh, to our communities, to charitable organizations in terms of volunteering their time. So. Uh, I likewise encourage everyone to take a, a closer look at the report. It's really exciting. Uh, with that, I want to move really quickly. We're going to pass it right over to uh, Arif Kamani, um, who is uh, from our featured sponsor of the day, Mob Squad. Um, and he's going to lead uh, a very exciting panel uh, that we've entitled Bold Ideas for Canada's Immigration Future. Uh, so over to you, Arif. Thank you, Ian. I uh, appreciate the, the introduction. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, before we get into the panel, I just want to do a brief introduction of each of the panelists, uh, and then we can get into the into the discussion. Uh, so starting with the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson. So Madame Clarkson was Canada's 26th Governor General from 1999 to 2005. When she left Rideau Hall, she co-founded the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, which helped new citizens feel involved and included in Canadian life. Madame Clarkson arrived in Canada from Hong Kong with her family in 1942, and made the astonishing journey from child refugee to accomplished broadcaster, journalist, and distinguished public servant. Uh, moving to Lisa Lalonde, Lisa is the CEO of Century Initiative, a, a charity with a mission to enhance Canada's long-term prosperity, resiliency, and global influence by responsibly growing the population of Canada to 100 million by the year 2100. Lisa is an accomplished public speaker on the nonprofit sector public policy issues, philanthropy, social innovation, and so social impact. And finally, Dan Reese. Uh, Dan was appointed the group head of Canadian banking at Scotiabank in June of 2019. And in this role, Dan leads Scotiabank's personal and commercial banking and insurance businesses in Canada. Dan is also a member of the Scotiabank Women Initiative Advisory Board and was the honorary chair of the 2018 Ride to, Con to Conquer Cancer in support of Prince Margaret Hospital Foundation, as well as leading Scotiabank's ride teams from 2017 to 2019. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today. Um, starting with Madame Clarkson, 
uh, getting into some of the questions here. After you were Governor General, you co-founded and currently co-chair the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the ICC and your vision for the Institute? The reason why I founded the uh, Institute for Canadian Citizenship with my husband, John Ralston Saul, is that I came to this country as a two and a half year old refugee, having lost everything. And it wasn't lost, it was actually taken away from me in a war. I lived under bombardment. I ran from basement to basement with my mother holding a rope that was tied around my waist and around my brother's waist while the Japanese bombarded Hong Kong. Three weeks uh, into the war, we surrendered and we were the losers. And we were very fortunate in through a lot of luck and happenstance. And I think my father being very enterprising, he having fought on the British side, managed to escape at the surrender because they were all released, the Chinese troops, because they were told by their commander that since they were Chinese, they would be killed by the, by the conquerors, whereas the British would be put in prison camps. So he spent two and a half weeks looking for us as we were hiding in basements, as we were starving. And um, he finally found us hiding and we started to live a life under the occupation, which was not pleasant. And um, within four or five months, he realized if he could get us out, we could. And somehow, with luck and circumstances and a guiding star, which has been over me all my life, we were able to get on a Red Cross ship and be exchanged one for one for Japanese uh, sympathizers and uh, nationals um, on a long two and a half month trip from Hong Kong past Singapore through, south, through Cape Town through Rio de Janeiro and then Hong Kong. So I know what it's like to suffer loss. And it's not just losing something, oh gosh, that's gone. It's having it taken away. It's having interiorized that sense. And that's made me always passionate about the people who come to this country like me, who have lost everything. Or if they haven't through war or circumstance, they've lost it because they've made the courageous decision that they've got to live another kind of life that they're going to live a better life for themselves and maybe, and for their children particularly. So because I was the first immigrant, the first uh, refugee, certainly, and the second woman to become Governor General of Canada, I felt I owed it to the Canadian public after I left office to start something that would help others who had been in the same boat, to emphasize not only the fact of what a wonderful country this is, but how we can make it better through immigration. When I came to this country, the Ch Chinese head tax was still on the books. It had been put in in 1923 to discourage Chinese from coming. They came anyway, they saved up all the money, they borrowed, they, they did all sorts of things in order to come to Canada, the Golden Mountain, as it's called in Chinese, um, or to the United States, to, play, to work hard, send money home, and they were not allowed to bring their families and that was a real a horror. And I have seen the page in a Chinese, in a ledger in British Columbia, a PhD student sent it to me about five years ago, I'd never seen it before, where I am registered in the Chinese head tax book as Adrian Poi, female, nine years old. And you have to say that after, you know, after 69 years, uh, after actually 58 years, whatever, I became governor general of this country. No other country that have ever happened in except Canada. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And that's why I want to help citizens to be citizens. When I became governor general, I got all sorts of letters from grade six kids saying, you've become governor general. Now I think I can become governor general too. We signed by somebody, um, Carmen de Souza, so a little Portuguese girl. 11 years old, thinks that she can become governor general because I was. That's what I want for everybody in this country, that there be no boundaries. And that's what the Institute is about. So basically, we start with a lot of programs. We had special ceremonies for citizenship in which people exchange comments with, uh, with citizens who are already established. Um, and we find that, that the important thing is to introduce and make people feel comfortable with culture in this country that it belongs to them right from the moment you've decided you've become Canadian. And now we've, we're trying to have that begin before you become Canadian, but at least when you become a permanent resident, that everything, all our cultural institutions are open to you. I used to see the little kids going in to 
the Royal Ontario Museum in yellow school buses. And immediately I would think, what about their parents working on shift, working on assembly lines, working in people's houses, cleaning? When do they ever get a chance to go to a museum or an art gallery? You know, we should give them the chance. So that's what started our cultural access pass, now known as Canoe. You have entry through the Institute of Canadian Citizenship into about 1,700 uh, cultural institutions in Canada for free for your family for one year after you become a Canadian citizen, just by going on your app the day you become a citizen. And then you are also able uh, to go into almost all our provincial parks and all our national parks for free, and you get 50% off on Via Rail trip. Um, all of this is to build access and openness and say, we welcome you, we want you to be here. That's what it's about. And I think that is the reason why I wanted to be certain that the Institute take off for people who, who become citizens. It couldn't be more important because I think people want to belong. They don't want to be the different one. They may be different because they keep their food, their language, their customs, but they have the opportunity to transform in Canada as well. And that's why culture is important. That's why sport and, and all those activities are important to new Canadians, because they can keep what they want, but they will be transformed in Canada into something different. And that's what I wanted for everybody that comes to this country. And the more people that come to this country, the better it will be for us. You know, we need hundreds of thousands of immigrants. And we have to have the assurance, the self-assurance and the confidence as Canadians in our own values, in our own political system, in our own social structures, to say, we welcome you because we can help you to have a new life and you can help us to support these structures and you can help us to create something different and, and with your input. Thank you. That's an inspirational story and, uh, and a very bold vision for the uh, for the Institute and I think a very, very worthy one. And that actually segues well into my first question for Lisa, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the Century Initiative advocates for policies to increase Canada's population to 100 million by 2100, which is obviously an ambitious target. Why 100 million Canadians? Yeah, we uh, at Centre Initiative, we have a big, bold idea for Canada, which is 100 million people by 2100. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> we at Centre Initiative recognize the connection between population size. Um, it's directly linked to our prosperity and our quality of life. And what I mean by that is, you know, we are at a crossroads in our country. Our population is aging. We're having fewer children and our workforce is shrinking. Uh, in fact, our population is at its lowest growth rate since World War I. And uh, recent studies predicted that we will have a baby bust as a result of the pandemic. So when you look at these trends, an aging population, we're having fewer babies, fewer babies being born, it ultimately means that we will have fewer tax dollars to pay for our cherished public services the services that we hold dear, our healthcare, our education, our bridges, our roads, our infrastructure. Uh, if we don't grow our population, key industries will grow more slowly, be less productive, less dynamic, and less competitive, and will be less influential on the world stage. So from Century's perspective, we have a choice to make right now. We can manage our growth, or we can manage our decline. We need to get ahead of these trends in order to protect our prosperity and our quality of life for future generations. You know, often when I'm talking about our goal of 100 million, sometimes it's hard for people to wrap their head around. It's a big number. Uh, but I think what's more important or equally as important as the target, because we need a target to work, to work towards, to measure against. But the most important piece of this is how do we get there? How do we design a Canada for the future? How do we future-proof our country so that we can protect our prosperity and our quality of life for generations of Canadians that we will never see? And I think for that, it takes thinking differently about the present, thinking differently about our future, really thinking long-term, moving away from a focus on our, our next election, the next political cycle, the next business cycle, and really uh, supporting long-term thinking and planning. 
And that really is at the heart of what uh, Century does uh, and, and why we do the work that we do. That's, that's great. And I'd love to dive into some of those uh, specifics as we as we move on. But I'd like to bring Dan into the discussion uh, first here. Uh, so Dan, as some may know, one of Scotia's largest community commitments is a $500 million community investment by 2030 uh, through Scotia Rise. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about Scotia Rise and particularly why one of the focus areas is called helping newcomers feel at home faster? Sure, thank you. And, and thank you for having me. It's a uh... I, I'm really honored to be on this panel with these distinguished guests, and, and thank you for including Scotia in the program. Uh, as you mentioned, we just recently announced um, something called Scotia Rise, which we think is a sort of an optimistic handle for a series of things that we plan to invest in over the next number of years, including a couple of partnerships we'll be announcing hopefully in and around Canada Day to celebrate all great things Canadian. You know, Scotia Rise came about, in fact, as part of our overall, I would say, you know, corporate commitment to making Canada an even more kind of competitive and encouraging and welcoming country in advance even of COVID arriving, because we felt very strongly whether it was the importance of inclusion, the importance of participation, the importance of resilience that, you know, Canadians, particularly newcomers, can sometimes find it difficult to find their way. Not not even just to get a leg up, just to get a, a foot in the door on occasion. So we were concerned about some of the research we had seen uh, and some of the things we had heard from particularly local community groups around high school education rates, um, the sense of optimism being lower than what we would have hoped uh, among kind of teenagers and young Canadians, especially uh, family members of those who've arrived. And so as part of looking to you know, improve Canada's competitiveness, and give back to communities. We felt it was important to put a, a big stake in the ground. So we announced a $500 million commitment to take place over the next 10 years to support education, uh, inclusion, and welcoming of newcomers in particular. Newcomers are, um, they, they often arrive with a level of motivation that's, that's hard to measure, but we all know what I mean when I say that. They come with tremendous skills, often also with tremendous education education credentials, and more often than not, they come with a limited network. And so some of the things we'll be doing are, are looking to encourage particularly entrepreneurs to find their way in terms of getting a business started, uh, in particular uh, female entrepreneurs, and looking to support parts of the country that might not be quite as obvious as destinations for immigrants. Sometimes the people's frame of reference is, look, it's Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, but for those of us across the country, you know, there's a lot of people moving to Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, and so we want to make sure we're encouraging and inviting local community groups to make, um, you know, to provide resources and access to ensure that the distribution of the population is consistent with kind of how we can support infrastructure and be competitive going forward. That's great. And I think, uh, again, another worthy, worthy initiative. This is a very esteemed panel of all working on very important things for the future of Canada. So it's an honor to even just be, be a part of this. Uh, let's get into some of the, the bold ideas and how that would actually work. And I want to jump back actually to Lisa and any of you at any time, if you feel you want to jump in, please feel free to do so. Um, but going back to the goal of 100 million Canadians by 2100, as you likely know, Canada has already announced uh, that they want to bring in over 1.2 million immigrants over the next three years, which is about 400,000 a year. The Century Initiative goal would be close to double that uh, from now until 2100, which is again, and, and you know, moving from an incremental target to a very aspirational target. And you'd mentioned uh, that there are some things we need to do to be able to do this successfully uh, that that Century Initiative is working on. Do you want to highlight a couple of those and just give us a flavor for some of the things that? we would need to do as a nation to move from where we are now to, to where this vision is? For sure. Um, well, first I wanna say that 100 million people by 2100 is not as ambitious as it sounds. Um, what we're talking about is steady staged increases. And in fact, based on some conference board of Canada modeling that we've done recently, we are already on track for this level of growth. Um, and. It may sound high to some, but I would argue that we've done this before. 
1913, Canada brought in more than 400,000 newcomers, which at the time was 5% of the population. Uh, now the annual targets, uh, they're under 1% of the population. Uh, so we've done it before, we can definitely do it again. I think, you know, another, as I was reflecting on this, um, listening to you, I think there's another question in there, uh, and it's linked to your question, which is, are Canadians ready? Are Canadians ready for this growth and this change? And I think the answer to that question, uh, there's, there's, it comes in two parts. The first is that uh, in order for Canadians to be ready, in order for this to happen, we need to build a compelling case to Canadians for growth with Im immigration as a driver of that growth. Uh, you know, we are uh, open to immigration. We were at the top of the, of the Canadian, um, we are at the top of the migrant acceptance list, um, you know, but we cannot take that for granted. Um, it may not always be the case. And I think that we need to um, ensure that we're actually building that case on an ongoing basis. Um, and I also think that it means uh, to do that, not shying away from the challenges or the issues that come with growth uh, and immigration of a, as a driver of that growth. And I think we have to tackle some of those arguments head on. When I'm presenting, immediately after I present, I'm usually flooded with uh, tweets and messages around uh, the same things, affordable housing, uh, the environment, and also colonization. Um, and uh, job, job opportunities. And so, um, so we have to tackle those. And so essentially when we talk about staged steady increases, uh, population growth, um, what we mean is that we need to plan long-term and invest uh, in issue or in areas like urban development and infrastructure investment. So how do we ensure that the cities can accommodate this big, bold vision of Canada that we have? Um, we have to also invest in employment and entrepreneurship to attract and grow the talent that we need in Canada. Uh, we have to invest in education and early childhood support so that families who want to have children can, and that women do not have to make a choice between a career or a family. And then we also have to invest in skills training uh, so that we can help uh, people develop the skills they need for employment both for jobs that exist now, but also into the future. And I think a key part of this is ensuring that um, we take a very disciplined approach to this work and that we have the data and insights to inform our planning. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why Century Initiative uh, created and launched a national scorecard on Canada's growth and prosperity. So what it is, it's a tool that we hope that policymakers and practitioners will use uh, to help uh, track and, in, and guide efforts related to uh, our growth and prosperity. And I think some, the tool itself is unique because um, rarely would you find measures uh, like the ones we have in our scorecard together in one document. So some examples include uh, immigration, uh, well-being, climate, productivity, social progress, youth educational success. What it is trying to do is, again, take a systems level view, a holistic view of what's needed to support this long-term growth. Great. That, that makes sense. And I'd actually like to touch on something that you and, and a couple of the panelists have already mentioned, which is just around uh, some of the regional growth. I think when, you know, especially in, in our business, when we hear people who want to want to come to Canada and are looking to immigrate, they've often heard of Vancouver and Toronto. But I think in order to do this successfully, we have to uh, expand this uh, mentality to grow nationally. And I think but I'm Clarkson has some really good experience with uh, with seeing growth of, of immigrants in, in different regions of the country that are outside of maybe the cities that everybody's heard of. So I don't know if you want, if you're able to speak to some of that and how you think it's been done Absolutely. successfully, how we actually I, step into that. I feel very strongly about this because I think there's there are misconceptions on the part of a lot of people that immigrants want to go to big cities because that's where they'll be able to buy their papadoms and um, and you know get their sari mended if they need it or get find the you know ten different kinds of soy sauce within ten minutes of themselves and that isn't really you know that's not the first thing that immigrants who've come to start a new life with all the courage that that needs if that's not the first thing their first thing is where will their children go to school? And so I make the plea here for public education. 
we cannot have a successful immigrant nation without good public education. The children of immigrants need to go to public schools, meet other children, and it must not cost them anything. I'm very concerned that with the growing income gap in Canada, that there is tremendous emphasis on, on um, giving your child, once you get to be a, a certain upper middle class, middle class or middle class person, you've got to send your child to a private school. I am totally against this. I, I've said this publicly and I always will. Public education formed me, formed my husband. We went to public schools. We went to universities in Canada that are basically very well supported and funded when you compare it with, say, the United States. Um, and we were able to have these educations and we were able to meet everybody in our schools. That is what is important. When I think of the kids that I went to public school with, I went to school in Ottawa and at my public school at Kent Street School, we had children from the Breton Flats. They did not have indoor plumbing. I'm talking late 40s, all right? But at Le Breton Flats, there were houses that did not have indoor plumbing. You didn't have to be in the back of beyond in northern, northern reaches somewhere. And these children did not have a chance to have a bath more than once every week or two weeks. And I'm, I mixed with them. They came to my birthday parties, and I went to theirs. And it was really very important in a country like Canada that we have that mix, that we are a country where everybody gets together and understands that they have depended at the beginning on the kindness of strangers. That's the line from Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire, Blanche Dubois, who's kind of schizophrenic and maybe even an nymphomaniac. But anyway, she keeps repeating this phrase of, you know, I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. I always think of Vivian Lee with her southern accent saying that. And in many ways, we as immigrants depend upon the kindness of strangers. And then we have to give up something, perhaps, to take that kindness. But we have been given it. And that I saw myself. I came to Canada when there were no reception facilities for refugees. I came to, in the middle of a war. We did depend on strangers. And these strangers became important to us. And I will say, for Dan's benefit, that the bank the bank manager was one of the most important people in my parents' life because my father said, we lost everything. And I, you know, and he, he had a job for three years in the, as a lowly clerk in the Department of Trade and Commerce because, you know, his English was good being from Hong Kong and he was very good with numbers and that enabled us to live a decent life and have a little apartment, two little apartments. And then later, because of the bank manager and everything, we were able to buy a house and put his office for his first trading company in it. And I still look at that bank when I go to Ottawa and I kind of venerate it. <laughs> and I think that was the way it, my father started his business. And I got my first bank account when I was nine with my own bank book. And I had an allowance of $1 a week. And my father said, save 50 cents and spend 50 cents. <laughs> and that was it. Uh, was always very important. So those strangers, those people like the banks and the schools, the people are the ones that you depend on. Also in Canada, we have to get used to the idea that it isn't just the big cities that matter. Um, and, and people are often surprised, well, I will say that because I've, you know, I, I went to the University of Toronto, I've lived in a big city, I've lived in cities. But as governor general and also before when I was a journalist traveling for the country for CBC, I went to places and I know this country. And when we went to meet the first plane load of Syrians that arrived in January five years ago um, with my grandchildren, my husband, and we were, it was wonderful. We went to the first plane and arrived at 6.40 in the evening and we welcomed these people. And it was so marvelous to see the women were well-dressed in their winter Syrian clothing with light wool and beautiful little belts on. And as we waited and we were able to talk to them and, and we had translators, you know, one of them said to me, do you know where Moose Jaw is? <laughs> I said, I had, do know where Moose Jaw is. I've been there a number of times. You'll love it. It has a hot springs and it's in the middle of the prairies, which is very rich with wheat and everything. That's where we're going. She said. And I said, you'll love it. And I wish we could more you know, make sure that we have people who go out. They don't want to initially. They think, oh gosh, you know, what will I do in that town of 40,000 people when I've come from a, a sophisticated place like Aleppo or Damascus or whatever? Why would I do that? But in a smaller community, even if there's prejudice and bigotry, 
people handle that often much better because there's only one or two schools. People know your family. They know you're the Syrian family. You just came one, one, you know, one month ago or one year ago. And prejudice and bigotry have their, are, are most strong when they're anonymous, when there is a they with a facelessness or just a slanted eyes or just thick lips or just curly hair or just everybody has black straight hair. That's where you get prejudice. You don't get it when people look at a little individual person and see that person. And I was told that when I went to Red Deer, uh, they invited me to Red Deer after I became governor general because they said, uh, you have to come out here and see how we have made out of this city a place that is like Toronto. We have as many ethnic, ethnic varieties here. And 10 people got up and spoke one after the other saying that they would never have dreamed of fetching up in Red Deer. But now that they ha were there, they wouldn't live anywhere else. Plus, there was a job that just happened to be a time when there were jobs there, too, which is really important. But that's the kind of thing we have to concentrate on in policies to make these places uh, real and to, for them to welcome people. Saskatchewan was welcoming people a while back because they had the jobs. So we have to put together that infrastructure in terms of, of what we can, we can give to people economically and what we can give them socially. Nowadays, it's no problem to find foods of your, of your background. You can order it in. Everybody orders things online now, and you don't have to worry about getting Zatar. I mean, I can get Zatar at Loblaws now. You know, five years ago, I couldn't get Zatar or Sumac, right? Now I get it. So it's really not those little things that count. The things that count are the way people will welcome you, the way they feel when they look you in the eye and say, you know, we know that you're a human being like us. And in Canada, we have pioneered, remember, nobody understands or thinks about this much. Because of the Vietnamese boat people, when we took in all those tens of thousands of ethnically, you know, of Vietnamese people, and we had never had any Vietnamese people in Canada before 1979, never. We had Chinese people, but we didn't have, you know, Vietnamese people. And Canadians did not feel that the government was bringing enough in at 25,000, and they said, we will sponsor. And that was what happened with Operation Lifeline and individual families and parishes and synagogues and social clubs. I remember flyers, you know, in, in the parking lot at Costco that said, we're having a meeting tonight at such and such a street uh, because we want to sponsor a family from Vietnam. Come if you want to. And all of those stories are part of Canada. And that's the way in which we operate because we're a highly literate, highly organized country with a parliamentary democracy and the common law. And we should be able to do it better than anybody. And we should show the world. We are starting to show the world. And I think that's important. But we have to get the benefit out of it too. And, and as Lisa says, and I'm all for that, I think we don't we don't have enough people. Uh, we have this huge land mass and people say, oh, well, we can only live near the border because it's so cold or whatever. But, you know, we have the technology to develop how to live in other places um, in further north. Um, in many ways, it's a tragedy that Canada was divided sort of vertically like that. There were plans to do other things in which you would have north, northern kind of provinces and then southern ones. And maybe we would have done better that way. But in any case, now with technology being what it is, we can manage anything and we need the people. We need the people and we are the, you know, we are one of the most extraordinary countries in the world because we started with nothing. Let us never forget that unlike the United States, Canada is a poor country. Canada is a country that was started by people who really didn't come out with money and buy plantations to grow cotton with slaves. The United States has that kind of climate. English gentlemen went out to the United States to pioneer the United States. Not even pioneer, but anyway, whatever. In Canada, we didn't, we didn't have that. We have this rocky terrain. We have you know, all these riches in minerals, which the world envies, and they should. Um, but we never had that feeling that we were rich when I grew up in Canada in the 40s, we were a country that was modest and poor. And I say to people, we didn't have a car till I was 12. 
that wasn't just because I was an immigrant and a refugee. Nobody else in my public school had a car till they were about 10 or 12 either. And it was just that it was a country where people did not have that affluence. So we were working together to build a country. And everybody was keen, like the bank manager, to help you if you were starting a business, to do things with you. So that's the kind of enthusiasm and feeling that I think Canada still has within it because we're only one or two generations removed on any of us from immigrants. And some of us are immigrants themselves ourselves. We must keep that immigrant energy, that, that idea of we're willing to do anything. Just don't ask me to give up my integrity as a human being, but I'm willing to sweep streets. I'm willing to wash, wash down cars. I'm willing to clean houses. I'm willing to iron. I'm willing to work as a, as a nursing aide. I'm willing to do all those things in order for a life to be free for us to have democracy, for my children to be educated in a public school system and learn to be to do things and to be prime minister, to be governor general or whatever. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind always as we think not what is this a burden to us. It's not a burden to us when we receive people. It's a strength. It's human energy. Oh, thank you, and that, that resonates very deeply with myself. My parents are uh, immigrants from South Africa who came in the 70s during, uh, during apartheid. And, uh, yeah. and they, uh, you know, they came with nothing. My mom had five jobs when she moved to Canada because she couldn't get one, you know, so she had one for every day. And my dad was working overnight shifts at, uh, at hotels. And you know, they rose and they both became entrepreneurs in Canada and were super fortunate. And, uh, actually got to the point where, you know, when I was growing up, they got to decide, should we put our children in public or private school? And they chose public school because they wanted me to have the experience of, of you know, the true Canadian experience and, and meet a wide spectrum of, of individuals. And I couldn't be more grateful for, for having that because it really did, you know, form the foundation of, of my friends and, and what I believe the country can be. And so I, I couldn't agree more with, <laughs> with your stance. Can and, I just... Uh, uh... Yeah. I was going to say, may I build on Madame Clarkson's comments? Um, you know, everything she said, there was so much in there and it resonated. Uh, I think uh, part of building a compelling case, and I'm also seeing some of the audience uh, questions around attracting newcomers, immigrants to smaller communities, um, is giving Canadians who are already here, giving Canadians a stake in, um, in uh, the outcomes. And so uh, connecting immigration to local needs, uh, to local labor needs, um, connecting them to local communities. And as uh, Madam Clarkson said, it's, it's really tough to actually um, hate your neighbor when you were part of welcoming that neighbor to your community. Uh, and we have really some strong strategic assets uh, through our regionalization programs that the minister spoke to spoke about yesterday, um, you know they they haven't been perfect, but there's been so much learning from some of them, like the Atlantic Immigration Pilot, the Municipal Nominee Pilot, and I think that we need to leverage that, uh, learn from it, and um, and expand on it. And you know we are unique uh, with these programs, as I mentioned, and other countries look to them as models, and we need to to. Um, continue to invest in those to support, uh, you know, people coming to other communities. Um, <clears throat> also, in my past work, uh, I used to work in affordable housing. Uh, and D Dan actually wrote a really great piece fairly recently on housing and it, how do we approach affordable housing? How do we address that issue? As I mentioned, we have to tackle these issues head on. Uh, and I think that there's, I, you know, I used to always say whenever I spoke about housing that, a home is the single most powerful metaphor for a happy family life. And for those who don't have access to safe, affordable housing, the impact can be absolutely devastating. And I think it's really hard to disconnect from these issues because they're very personal issues if you can't, if you don't ever feel like you can afford a house of your own. Um, the minister said something yesterday, which, which I was bang on, which is, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And it's often used as an, as, a, as an argument to say we can't do immigration and we have to do less immigration because of city sprawl, because of you know uh, housing issues. Um, I think Dan's approach that he outlined in his op-ed is a great start to tackling that issue. Um, some recent federal uh, investments 
like the Rapid Housing Initiative, the National Housing Strategy are also really important. Um, and I think, you know, for, he, he also said something which I agreed with, which is, you know, immigrant, uh, adding newcomers as population growth can drive the housing agenda. It can attract people who, who are construction workers, who can actually help build our homes. It drives economic growth, which allows us to invest in more public services. Uh, it could actually help us address the issue longer term. But again, it speaks to what I said at, at right up front, which is, you know, when you're when you're in it, it's hard to think 10 years out, 15 years out. It's hard to detach yourself from from these these challenges. And I think what we're trying to do is say we have solutions like we haven't been thinking about the future when we've been designing cities. Uh, what if we actually design cities with 50 year planning in mind? Where would we be now? We can do that, we should do that, and we need to start thinking that way so that we can be a model to the world in how we welcome newcomers, how we advocate for human rights, and how we build sustainable cities. Oh, that's that's great, and it actually leads me right exactly where, where I was hoping to go, which is to Dan's op-ed in the Globe and Mail, which was titled, Why Canada Needs to Focus on Ways to Encourage More Home Building. Um, and this focused on some of the things you mentioned, which. Uh, you know, shows the issues that Canada has in certain communities where su housing supply is having challenges meeting the demand that currently exists. And obviously more immigration would, would potentially further exacerbate that problem. So do you want to highlight some of the ways that you propose that we address this and, uh, and how, you know, even with increased immigration, we could, we could continue to address this in a way that's sustainable? Look, it's, um, it's also it's possible it's almost where lisa was a few minutes ago which is how on earth will we grow the population at these rates well we have in the past so how do we resolve the housing supply issue well we used to build a lot more houses we chose to slow down it's it we kind of lost our way there in terms of i would say particularly government support for expanding the stock of housing units and and that's perhaps a complicated way of saying, yes, more apartment buildings, yes, more condos, yes, more multi-townhouses, yes, more single detached. And I think what, what has happened is that the um, the municipal um, uh, the municipal decisioning framework has really ground to a halt in in the large cities in particular, because people are nervous about what the realities of densification might feel like for them personally and that's a that's very understandable if you're here and if you're an owner but most people um, that come to Canada want to find a place to raise their families get them educated have accessible health care and get on with doing whatever it is they want to do and so if they can't find a place to live it's a major problem so I'm really encouraged with regards to the conversations that have started in the last few months with ministers of housing and ministers of immigration, because I think there's a, a growing view that um, the demand and the supply can be solved together. That is to say, immigrants are a source of construction workers and have an appetite for home ownership and for rental stock. And so we should be accelerating our appetite for in inviting and then welcoming skilled trades. And that does not just mean, to be clear, people with shop levels it means it means operating heavy complicated equipment construction design it backs up all the way into architecture and engineering it's a full ladder and so i think what i'm encouraged by is a number of the big cities have mayors who have kind of clicked into the reality of i need to build a school i need a tax base population is beginning to move out of the large cities affordability is a real issue and immigrants are driving my economy and so I need, as a mayor, to accelerate the approval process. On our behalf as banks, we are working as much as we can with the, call them the, the successful developers in the major markets to encourage them to be building outside of, outside of the downtown core. The big challenge with that, away from what I've discussed, is it does mean more car traffic. That's not great. And so back to Lisa's comment around 50-year planning, where's public transit connecting by way of rail, Richmond Hill with Barrie, not just Barrie with downtown Toronto. And so I, I do think planning between the levels of government needs to accelerate. Housing and immigration are related. 
And unless we go down this path, we will lose great people to the U.S. The U.S. has cheaper housing, cheaper housing, lower taxes, and a more attractive climate for many. And so I do think Canadians should remember we are competing on a global scale for all sorts of resources, talent included. And unless housing becomes more affordable, it will become a barrier and more supply is definitely part of the answer. And um, may I build on that one as well? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm glad you mentioned the global talent piece. I, in the last couple of years, under the previous president of the United States, Canada was able to, to leverage the fact that other countries like the U.S. were where they were closing their doors and closing their borders uh, we were opened, we were uh, welcoming, and we wanted newcomers. Uh, we wanted uh, to meet our talent needs and drive innovation. Uh, but, you know, what we're seeing now is countries like the UK, Australia, um, the USA, they're all introducing uh, very uh, aggressive campaigns to recruit uh, talent from around the world. Uh, and we need to keep that top of mind when we're actually uh, developing our policies um, that while we are an open society, we have to also make sure that we're um, keeping our eye on the ball, uh, so to speak, to attract uh, talent. And I think, you know, the minister spoke to it yesterday as well, that, you know, talent, we're, we're understanding the definition of talent differently than we have in the past. Uh, what is an essential worker? Um, and I think that our policies will be, um, will continue to be, uh, to shift in that direction uh, to, you know, not be what they were 20 years ago. But I think that the pandemic has really shone a light on what do we need? What, how do we define talent and how do we attract uh, that talent to Canada? I think it's very interesting about housing because a hundred years ago, when I had just graduated from university, a number of us were very taken with the Scandinavian model of housing and town planning, because even then, I'm talking the early 60s now, even then it was evident that we were having to build highways and we were going to be having to commute and da 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 da. And in, we went to, a number of us went to the Scandinavian countries and I've always remembered in Finland, outside Helsinki, there was a, uh, there was a ray, they, were, they had a, a kind of spoke like system, and you went out for a half an hour on a train, on, uh, on a, basically a subway or an, uh, an LRT, LRT, we'd call it now. Um, and there were four high rise buildings of 24 stories each in the middle of a thousand acres of forest. And, and these buildings held, I don't know how many people, but they didn't divide it all up on the ground with everybody having their little acreage, etc. People lived in these towers and then they had the whole of the forest as theirs and in it were the amenities. They had, sw they had swimming pool, they had various things. And these are kinds of models that we haven't really been looking at or been serious about, mainly because of the way in which I guess we have laid out uh, land to be developed and to be subsumed by private interests, etc. Not in, in 1911, this statistic always sits with me. In 1911, Stockholm put in a green belt around the city um, so that you have a green belt around Stockholm. You don't have that kind of thing. Then they started satellite towns when they had developed the kind of a light rail transit that we now all look at. So there are, there are models that have existed for a long time. And I think one of the Canadian values has always been to have your own home and to make sure that, you know, your family is around you. That's just something that's very Canadian. There's no point in saying to us, oh, the French don't live like that. They live in apartments all their lives and, you know, they don't mind that. We're Canadian. We have different values. We have a different history. We have every right to have that. Don't tell me about other people's ideas. But we do have wilderness and we do have climate like the Scandinavians. Uh, we do. And that's something that we should be looking at. We have been looking mainly at the wrong models. You know, Mr. Levitt, who invented Levittown in the United States, that was great with their climate, with everything. But we don't necessarily have to have houses, you know, on these small lots with 40 foot frontage and two car garages. Maybe everything can be underneath and we can build towers up. 
And I think we have to really start looking at solutions like that that will help us to remain Canadian with our traditions of, yes, we want to have homes for our families and we want to own them, basically, and yet not ruin the little urban, the, the little ag agricultural land that we have in the South, um, which we need to produce our food. And, um, and that's always been, whenever I see a farm being taken over, and it's in the, always around an hour of Toronto or an hour and a half, I'm always thinking, oh, food, that could be food. <laughs> it really bothers me. It really, really bothers me. And so I think, you know, Dan, you've got, you've got the right idea. You're on the right track because people want that. How do we do it so that everybody benefits out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's that's a good segue uh, to one of the audience questions uh, that has come up, which I think is more broadly speaking about uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emission. And just if we were to increase the country's population from 40 million to 100 million gradually over the next uh, you know 60 years or 80 years, that may cause climate impacts that uh, we're not necessarily considering right now. And I just wanted to get perspective from uh, probably starting with Lisa, just because I'm sure that's, that's been thought about through centuries work here, but how do we, how do we think through the, the climate impact of, of a growing uh, population? Sure, it's a good question and it's one I often get. Uh, so I just wanna stress too that Century Initiative advocates for population growth primarily through immigration. So keep in mind these people are already on the planet. Um, and so, uh, what, and, and that part of the reason why we've recognized that immigration is the only realistic approach uh, to supporting our population growth goals is because our fertility rates are just not keeping pace uh, at all. And, um, and there's been, even with significant incentives, um, research has shown that uh, there's very little impact on uh, increasing fertility rates with certain policy interventions. So ultimately it's, it's uh, attracting people who are already on the planet to come uh, based on our strong uh, economic immigration system. Uh, so the next question I get is on city sprawl, uh, which is kind of linked to how can we ensure that we're encouraging settlement in other parts of uh, the country. Um, but there will always be growth within the cities. And so our position is that, you know, when planned well, uh, and that's the key, when we plan well and we think for the long term, density can support our objective of a more sustainable economy. It can contribute to reduced emissions, shorter commute times, and vibrant communities. Um, it could also, uh, in small and medium-sized cities, increased density means stronger local economies and also improved access to services and supports. So I'm originally from a small town in Northern Ontario. You know, my family member um, it has to, if she has, you know, a, a serious illness, she has to drive to Sudbury, which is like three hours away. Uh, not very sustainable. Um, and so uh, this is where it's, you know, if we're thinking about, how do, we, how do we build our cities uh, in a way that is more sustainable, that has less of an impact on our economy, that's thinking ahead, planning for the long term? But a key aspect of this, what I, which I wanted to raise, is that the ability for Canadian city, cities to effectively manage this growth is also impacted by their fiscal capacity, so how much money they have available to do it. Um, and uh, as responsibilities within these municipalities have increased, the revenues necessarily haven't. And so, so that is another, this is why, I, you know, I really appreciated Dan's op-ed um, and some of the work that's coming out of Scotia because it digs deep into the nuts and the bolts of how to make this do it, how to make this happen um, within a federation. So it's not an easy answer, but um, again, density can actually be a good thing and could lessen our impact on the environment. I really appreciate that, and that that makes a lot of sense. I could spend hours talking about this with each of you, but I want to be respectful of time, and we have about five minutes left, so I just wanted to leave some time for, for closing remarks. If anybody has anything they want to leave the group with here uh, on on some of these bold ideas and, and solutions to some some very interesting challenges. One of the Maybe. things I... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, no, go ahead. Yeah. I haven't heard you for a long You're time. You're so now. eloquent. I thought you would do the big close. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I would just I would just make the the following point. Um, 
for the immigrants who've just arrived, meaning a week ago or a year ago or two years ago, we still have work to do to welcome them properly into all parts of Canada. And they will be, in my opinion, the number one source of a great experience conversation with prospective immigrants, whether it's immediate or extended family or neighbors that they had in Lahore, Pakistan. So, you know, albeit we're, we're reaching far afield to find new wonderful people to come here, the people that have just arrived know exactly who those people are. And so for those of us who are in the business today of welcoming, p please continue to do the great work that you're doing because it has a massive difference in terms of whether people choose Canada or elsewhere. And the, the second point is, to be clear, most people that leave a country have chosen to leave it. It's now a case of which country they choose to go to. And so Canada does need to continue to work very hard to be attractive. And while I lose sleep overnight as a, as a, as a, as a parent and hopefully a grandparent one day with regards to the environmental implications of Canada becoming bigger, the population of the planet is also likely to continue to grow. And we think, I think at least, I prefer for more of them to be in Canada, educated here, helping make the planet better from Canada rather than being elsewhere and not being as, I would say, proactive, positive and constructive at making the planet more sustainable. So I would just close by saying I'm really encouraged by what Minister Mendicino has been saying. Uh, he's taking a, a lot of complicated, difficult positions that have long-term benefits. And so the extent to which we can encourage that level of government to work more closely with local governments, I think is part of where the answer is. And we'll certainly do our best here at Scotia to make that happen. Thanks for having us. Appreciate that. The one thing I would like to talk about is not wasting any of the talents that we may be attracting uh, in, in immigration. And that's why we work very hard at the Institute to look at the question of people's credentials. How many times have you had uh, known somebody who was a lab technician or uh, a nurse or whatever, and you say to them, and it's my habit, I've always said this for about 20 years, what did you do when you were in India or wherever? And they'll say, I was a doctor, and now you know they're a lab technician. And that's because we require people to go right through medical school again uh, to do that. And there are other ways to do this. I know we want to be sure that our health is looked after and that, that the accreditations are equal. But there are countries which we don't think of as being in the leadership role for uh, attracting um, immigration, like Germany. Uh, Hamburg, for instance, as a city state, sends out people from their medical school their medical schools to say India and they will go to Mumbai, Delhi, etc. They will assess the medical schools and then they will come back and say if you come from any of these medical schools in India you will need another course in anesthesia, you will need two extra courses in surgery, you will need this in alphabet and that will take you a total of two years and you have to qualify those two years and then you will be able to be a doctor in, in Germany. We say to them, you can't be a doctor unless you go to medical school when you come to Canada. And nobody who's age 35 or so decides that. So we lose a generation, perhaps, of talent. And this goes for other things like engineers, lawyers, and so on. Um, because those are closed shops in Canada. And of course, we have a federal system. We have those shops are, you know, the law societies of each of the provinces for lawyers, the engineer societies, all of them. And they are protective. And so we have to have a society and keep it up because we are a society that is a forgiving society. The world divides itself, itself into two kinds of societies, punishing societies and, and forgiving societies. We have always been a forgiving society because a country of immigration has to be. In many ways, you have to be able to leave behind things that were not right and, and have not made a good thing for you and your family, perhaps, even though you may love the place you originally came from. Your chance to be transformed into a Canadian is that we we don't know about what happened before and we don't really want to know. We only say, you come to us and we will help you be new. And that's, that's the benefit 
of being a country like Canada. And so we have to make sure that we don't lose any talents along the way. We can't afford to. We want to build the, the personal uh, resource of people's talents that is a kind of non-monetary wealth. And we want to be able to sure, be sure that everybody's talent is used and that not a generation is lost. Just as when people used to say to my parents, sometimes very nice people like our lawyer, our insurance agent, the bank manager, you know, don't worry, your kids are wonderful and they'll be real Canadians in a generation. And my father always said to us after we heard that, and we'd hear it from very well-meaning people. My father said, don't listen to that. You are Canadians now and Canada is your country. And that's, that's the message. Well, I can't, uh, can't put, it, put it any better than that. So I think that's a, that's a great way to close the session. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to, uh, to speak with us today and, and add some really good insights on something that's extremely important for both the present and future of Canada. So, so thank you all, and uh, we'll pass it over to Ian. Thank thanks you. so much, RF. Uh, thanks again uh, for facilitating a great session and, and to Mob Squad for the sponsorship of, of the session. Uh, an absolutely fantastic discussion. Uh, thanks so much to Madam Clarkson, to Dan, and to Lisa. Great stories, great insights, uh, ambitious ideas, uh, exactly what we needed to, to kick us off for today. Um, so um, now, as usual, uh, as the session closes, uh, you'll be returned to the engagement hub. Uh, we'll be moving to our concurrent uh, session slot for the day. You'll have the choice between uh, one session that's focusing on intercultural competencies and economic integration um, and another session that's focusing on immigrants and essential work. Um, as we've been saying throughout, uh, it's a choice just to watch live, um, but you'll be able to catch up on any sessions that you missed through the engagement hub for up to 30 days afterwards. So uh, we invite everyone to take what is now, I think, about a 12-minute break uh, to stretch, uh, get a break from your screen, grab a glass of water, and we'll see everybody back here um, right at uh, two o'clock. Um, thanks again so much to the panelists and to Mob Thank Squad. Um, have a great day. Bye.